Soldiers, uh, you could say, were the main actors in the February Revolution. This revolution, like most revolutions, took place not because anyone rose up, but because the forces of the existing order lost the will uh, and the capacity to defend that order. But the process of disengagement from the Tsarist uh, war did not end in February 1917. Soldiers were ripe for Bolshevik propaganda on an immediate end to the war. And the Bolsheviks were clearer and more categorical on this point than any other political grouping, including socialists, uh, in 1917. And it's hard to overstate just how important that was as a factor in their victory. <clears throat> but the Bolshevik diatribes against the imperialist war did not mean that their own new regime was demilitarised. Of course not. This was partly because so many of their supporters in 1917 to 18 were soldiers first, peasants second, and communists only a distant third. But above all, it was because the Bolsheviks would very soon have to remilitarize Russian society for their own existential struggle in the Civil War. This was a disconcerting and in many ways counterintuitive move. Socialism was meant to be against militarism. But here was a socialist regime plunging into armed conflict and total mobilization of society, or at least the parts of society that it had under its control. Universal conscription was reintroduced in 1918, um, and in the uh, Civil War, the Bolsheviks would mobilise about five million men. Only about one-sixth of their total forces were volunteers. And they had to go a long way beyond their core proletarian constituency. At the end of 1920, almost 80% of the 5.5 million Red Army soldiers were peasants. As uh, Sanborn has shown, the Bolshevik system of, of sticks and carrots for soldiers in wartime continued and completed the post-1905 Tsarist efforts to build a loyal modern army. There was a direct link between soldiering and citizenship. The Bolsheviks inherited the, this uh, Tsarist mission um, uh, while the, the Tsarist regime had lost the confidence of the military professionals that it had the army's best interests at heart. Hence the transfer of allegiance from uh, Tsarism to Bolshevism or, or, or some kind of revolutionary regime was quite natural for the 8,000 Tsarist officers who declared their loyalty to the Bolsheviks after the collapse of the provisional government. But that raises a tricky question. Was the party making the military in its image or was the party itself being taken over by the military, becoming mi militarized? This was a controversial issue at the time, as many Bolsheviks fretted about the continued employment of non-communist military professionals from the Imperial Army. And what of the post-Civil War era? Should the Red Army then try to create a regular standing army and reinstate normal military hierarchies? Or should it aim for something much more radical, like a militia army? What should be the balance between those two models of army? The debate on these matters in the first half of the 1920s was extremely heated, not least because it overlapped to a considerable extent with the main political struggle going on in the party at that time between Trotsky and everyone else. At first glance, the military professionals would seem to have won the argument. Uh, one man command, Yedina Nechalia, was re-established in 1925 uh, with a uh, concomitant downgrading of political commissars. There was a definite trend towards uh, professionalization of the Soviet military in the late 1920s, uh, with a corresponding rise in its sense of self-worth. But actually, this was all happening very much on the party's terms. If the Bolsheviks were willing to let the officer corps do things its own way more of the time, that was because they were confident that the army elite by the mid-1920s had been largely communized. Soviet military schools were starting to turn out more people, so the percentage of uh, communists uh, rose from uh, just under a quarter of officers and just under a fifth of administrative personnel in 1923 to more than 40% of the combined staffs in 1925. Um, and the militarization of Soviet life was harnessed to party objectives. Industrialization, 
which was practically synonymous with militarization in the period of the first five-year plan, and collectivization, effectively war on the village. The military leadership pushed back a little against collectivization in 1930. It was absolutely disastrous for the morale and loyalty of peasant conscripts, but the mobilizatory campaigning ethos that Bolshevism shared with the military had already done much to turn the rural world upside down. But actually, the question of who called the shots, the party or the military, may miss the point about Bolshevism in the 1920s and afterwards. The Bolsheviks were forged as a political unit in the Civil War, and they had the characteristics of a military caste. This became more pronounced with time as infighting grew more bitter. The defeat of the right opposition at the end of the 1920s was in large part the victory of the militarized section of the party leadership over the civilians, Nikolai Bukharin and Alexei Rykov. Then think of the extraordinarily violent and militarized rhetoric of the so-called Cultural Revolution of 1928 to 32. The whole of society in the 1920s was infused with the recent memory uh, and the habits of war. And the relationship between party and army was not, at least not yet, a zero-sum game. Witness industrialization that I've already mentioned was in large part, militarization. It was uh, directed at, at the, the, the needs of uh, rearmament. You also find a great deal of congruence in worldviews, uh, as um, uh, uh, Mark von Hagen, amongst others, have pointed out, between the Bolsheviks and the military. Uh, uh, the, the value of discipline, a, con a certain contempt for individualism, for commerce, uh, and for liberalism. In the 1930s, the army's hand was further strengthened by the dangerous international situation, most immediately the Japanese invasion of Manchuria in 1931. Military training became more firmly institutionalized in Soviet society. But then, but then the Stalinist leadership pointed out the difference between militarization and militarism uh, that would accord uh, weight to the army per se. The great terror uh, as I'm sure you all know, took a very heavy toll of the military command and officer corps. And the irony uh, um, uh, was that this immensely militarized country was actually rather poorly prepared for World War II when it finally arrived. This was partly a matter of, of, the, of the purge, of the terror, which plunged the military high command into turmoil at just the moment it needed to be drawing conclusions from the early phases of World War II, especially the disastrous Finnish campaign of 1939 to 1940. At the, time, at the time of the German invasion, the Red Army simply had too few officers, 85% of the number it needed or 67,000 short of requirements. And it would lose uh, tens of thousands uh, more over the first six months of the war. But a more fundamental problem with the Soviet armed forces in 1941 was longer term and structural. Military professionals were better paid at the end of the 1930s than at the beginning of the decade. Titles of rank had been reintroduced in 1935, and the army was better resourced in terms of materiel and weaponry. Um, military prof professionalism was taking shape despite the terror. Uh, in 1939, a law on universal military service reduced social class criteria. And in combination with a reduction in territorial units in the army, this ostensibly meant that the army could now be a true crucible of a Soviet nation. But military expertise had not developed as fast as it needed to in the 1930s. One problem was that the purge of pre-revolutionary military specialists in the Cultural Revolution had got rid of uh, the available expertise. Another was what uh, Roger Rees has called the civilianization of the armed forces due to the constant transfer of party members into and out of the army. This significantly impeded the creation of a military ethos. So despite all the material advances of the 1930s, the officer corps was not actually any better trained. Rees has called the Red Army, quote, institutionally incompetent in 1939. 
And this situation was exacerbated by the terror that tended to spare uh, the, the Stalin loyalists from the era of the Civil War. In other words, their notions of how to fight a war were anachronistic, rather more to do with cavalry than with tanks. As John Erickson puts it, for almost two years, the Soviet Union tried to fight the formidably modern war machine of Germany with a pattern or model of organization drawn from the far off days of the Civil War, for this was the only one known at the outset to be viable. But what's remarkable is how quickly, given all of these liabilities, the Soviets were able to turn things around. And here's where the militarization of society and, and economy and the cross-contamination of military and civilian life uh, becomes an asset rather than a, a weakness. In an important sense, whatever the cat catastrophic defeats of 1941, the USSR was very well prepared. Uh, the military itself might have been in a poor state, but society and the economy were already fully mobilized on a war footing. And with that advantage, the deficiencies in leadership uh, and war production could be made good remarkably quickly. There's a, uh, an astonishing evacuation effort um, and uh, uh, an, uh, an astonishingly fast redirection of the economy at uh, pressing defense needs. And in due course, Soviet industry would be outproducing the Germans in important areas. The war was decided less by inexhaustible supplies of Soviet soldiers and more by tank production. This was combined with a reversion to the principle of uh, one-man command, Yedina Nechalia. Um, there was a certain amount of yo-yoing on the question of political commissars and whether they should be used, but they're, they're brought back um, in 1937, then they're removed in, in 1940, they come back after the German invasion, and then they're removed again. Uh, but for the most part, after the, after the uh, first year of, of the war, Stalin learns to take advice from the military. But such was the scale of recruitment into the party from the armed forces during World War II uh, that the Soviet leadership in 1945 was confronted with a question familiar from the Civil War. Was the party taking over the army or was the army taking over the party? What Stalin did was very firmly to keep the military in its place, partly due to fears of Bonapartism, partly to keep up, uh, to keep up the ideological initiative, and partly uh, out of economic concerns. Uh, the Soviet state didn't have the money to um, provide a generous settlement to war veterans. So provisions for veterans, both material and symbolic, became uh, rather scanty after 1947. Uh, there were ideological campaigns uh, to re, uh, restore the primacy of the party under Zhdanov. Uh, and uh, for good measure, Marshal Zhukov was uh, disgraced. From the mid-1950s, um, after, uh, uh, after the death of Stalin, relations between party and military were normalized in the sense that there were no more major wars and no more outbreaks of terror. But what can we uh, conclude about the relationship long-term between, between the party and the military? There was a, a large Sovietological literature on, uh, on the question of who had the upper hand. Um, at one, ex uh, at one end of the spectrum, you had uh, Roman uh, Kol Kolkovich uh, talking about the Soviet military as an interest group, quite able to assert its own uh, distinctive agendas. Uh, other people, uh, uh, such as Timothy Colton, um, uh, taking a more, a more nuanced view. The main thing is that the, the model of the zero-sum game uh, uh, again seems inappropriate. The army was quiescent in the second half of the Soviet period, not just because it didn't know any different, but also because it could advance its goals very securely under the leadership of the Communist Party. Yes, uh, Marshal uh, Zhukov, who was brought back uh, into the establishment after Stalin's death, had an, was once again disgraced by Khrushchev in, 19, uh, in 1957. Uh, but overall, the position of the, of the uh, military was improving. In 1955, the armed forces numbered 4.6 million personnel. Uh, and of those, almost 20% were officers. Uh, a, a, an extremely inflated number which added further to the already 
growing military lobby, as, as uh, Roger Rees points out. There's the further point that de-Stalinization is an awful lot, actually, about the war and war memory. Uh, it's about reclaiming the memory of World War II from Stalin personally. And to that extent, it, uh, it, it represents a symbolic improvement for the military professionals, a, a, a boost to them. It's true that Khrushchev was not a great friend to the army because he stood up to the military lobby and denounced troop cuts. But the fortunes of the military, both symbolic and material, um, seemed on a constant upward trajectory when a new general secretary came to power, uh, Brezhnev. There was the basic fact that the political elite was saturated with military experience. One third of Politburo members in 1966 had spent at least seven years in uh, military or military-related occupations, as Colton points out. The new leadership under Brezhnev had a healthy respect for military expertise and tended to allow senior officers considerable autonomy. Then there was the appointment of Marshal Gretschka as the new defense minister in 1967. Okay? And then he was made a... a, 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 a member of the Politburo in 1973, only the second defense minister to be elevated in that way after, uh, after Zhukov briefly in 1956-57. Then there's the fact that the military needs loomed very, very large in the Soviet planned economy. The mili military industrial complex was a vast and powerful entity. Perhaps half of the, of the uh, R&D budget was soaked up by this, by this complex. <clears throat> Most important for um, my purposes tonight, the army continued to pervade society, and it did so on a more secure footing than in the 1930s with a more elaborate set of institutions. The term of service was uh, reduced to two years in 1967, but the rate of induction was quite high, uh, and conscription was supported by a large pre-induction program under DOSAF, uh, the Voluntary Society for Assistance to the Army, Air Force, and Fleet. Under Khrushchev, uh, troop numbers had fallen to a low of 3.6 million in 1960, but they started to rise again in the mid-1960s, and they'd peak uh, only in uh, 1985. Military professionals were treated uh, better by the government than ever before. By the mid-1970s, a lieutenant earned a touch more than the average salary for white and blue-collar workers. And the more senior ranks in the army were correspondingly uh, better paid. And there were generous holiday and pension benefits as well. The armed forces also had a formidable political apparatus, the main political administration. The, this army branch of the party numbered 30,000 full-time political officers in 1963. As Ellen Jones puts it in her study, they were a cross between propagandists and military chaplains. Uh, and, and probably the numbers uh, uh, rose after that, although we, uh, we're not entirely sure about that. About a fifth of military personnel were party members, which was three or four times the rate in society at large. Um, the political administration seemed to be serving as a very effective conduit between the party and the military, two groups that most of the time enjoyed, uh, in Colton's words, a firm concurrence of practical objectives. They wanted the same things. But here's the paradox as we uh, move into the later stages of the, of the Soviet period. Soviet society still accorded uh, great prominence to war memory and military uh, preparation and the military full stop. But after 1945, it was not fighting any actual wars. There's this strange interlude of peace, uh, peace amid, amid cold, cold war. This changed with Afghanistan. And uh, with the start of the Afghanistan campaign, it turned out the armed forces were not in such great shape after all. In the late 1940s, in the wake of World War II, the Soviet army had been very cohesive and experienced. By the 1970s, as Rees has shown, the officer corps was starting to stagnate, with the military becoming a self-sustaining caste and levels of recruitment from outside military families in steep decline. It was noticeable that the Soviet military was very top-heavy, with a much uh, higher proportion 
of uh, officers uh, than, for example, in the US Army. Another important dif difference from Western arm um, armies was the weakness of the NCO Corps. Uh, this, along with the 1967 reform of conscription, is often uh, blamed for the prevalence in the Soviet and Russian army of uh, bullying, or uh, didovshina. There were also problems at the very top. The relationship between the military and the party top brass began to cool in the mid-1970s. In 1976, Ustinov, a close Brezhnev ally, was appointed the first civilian minister of defense since 1955. Um, uh, in 1976, a mini cult of personality developed around Brezhnev's supposed uh, military exploits. Um, this was, of course, uh, annoying to the military elite, um, uh, as was the uh, apparent retreat from traditional Soviet strategy. First detente, and then Brezhnev's disavowal of uh, strategic superiority in 1977. Um, you might think that the enduring cult of World War II is a countervailing trend. After all, it reaches its, its uh, uh, zenith in the, the late 1970s. November 1978 is the time that World War II veterans were finally granted a significant set of benefits and became a, a distinct status group, uh, as, as Mark uh, Adler points out in his important study of, 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 of Soviet veterans. Um, but the, this privileged uh, treatment of the warriors of the past uh, is not the same as militarization in the present. You could argue that they are almost mutually exclusive. Resources are always scarce, and the decision was taken uh, back in the late 1970s to distribute them for past achievements rather than, uh, uh, or more than, for present uh, feats. There were problems, too, in the main body of the army, the conscripts. Uh, from the late 1960s, a program of basic military training had been extended to compensate for the reduction in, in terms of service. The conscripts of the post-1967 era were considerably more urban and educated than their predecessors. But this did not necessarily make them more receptive to the hardships of military life, especially when those hardships included bullying, and when service took them to Afghanistan. The campaign in Afghanistan very quickly became a disorderly and violent counterinsurgency operation. Although it was not possible to discuss this openly in Soviet society in the early 1980s, it seems clear that the popular mood was turning against the war very soon, and with the rise to power of an extremely civilian general secretary, Mikhail Gorbachev, in 1985, the scene was set for a very significant pushback against the military. Gorbachev's outlook was, from the beginning, at odds with that of the military establishment. His doctrine of, quote, reasonable sufficiency in arms ripped up the blank check that the party had given the military in the first decade of Brezhnev's rule. Gorbachev's Politburo members had strikingly less military experience than their predecessors of 1966. Gorbachev was clearly more inclined to listen to the foreign ministry and the KGB than the army. Um, in due course, he, uh, Gorbachev began to purge the senior ranks of the army, and in December 1988, he announced the demobilization of half a million troops. The troop numbers fell from 5.3 million in 1985 to a little under 4 million in 1990. Worse still, uh, Glasnost, the Glasnost of the, of the Gorbachev era turned a harsh spotlight on all the most dysfunctional aspects of the army, Afghanistan and bullying uh, above all. It's little wonder that conscription soon became a nationalist cause in Georgia, Azerbaijan, and the Baltic republics. The new Soldiers' Mothers Movement, established in the summer of 1989, publicized figures on deaths of soldiers. All this brought a vast increase in draft evasion in the late 1980s and a corresponding decline in the quality of conscripts. <coughs> in due course, even the Holy of Holies was under attack. World War II, the cult of, uh, the, the, the cult of World War II. There's a, uh, a very telling book uh, 
well, a book with a very telling subtitle published in 1994 by the American scholar Nina Tumarkin on the memory of the war. The subtitle is The Rise and Fall of the Cult of World War II. Amazing to think that uh, um, someone in 1994 thought that, that the cult was in decline, but that is exactly how it seemed at that point. Um, another uh, sign of trouble was that the army was overstepping the strict ba boundaries between military and civilian life. It was remarkably undisciplined in its public role uh, at the end of the Soviet Union and just after. In the August coup, uh, the military proved leaderless and incapable of action. But a couple of years later, generals and officers were getting more political. This was a sign not of the army's strength, but rather of its weakness. The party's collapse had removed the main organizational structure, and military men were likely to seek to realize their ambitions, not in the army, uh, but in civilian politics and indeed the civilian economy. As Dale Herspring puts it of the 1990s, quote, the average Russian soldier was not certain whom to obey in a crisis, the Duma, the president, or perhaps a retired but highly popular general such as Alexander Libid. In the mid-1990s, it was common for military officers to run for election and to engage in public criticism of state policy. In the December 1993 parliamentary elections, all but four of the 16 parties had officers running on their electoral lists, although only 11 were actually elected. Um, and in 1996, of course, General Lebed ran for president and played a rather significant role in, uh, in, in Yeltsin's uh, re-election. Okay, all, uh, all of this is well described in a book by uh, Zoltan ba uh, Barani. By this time, things had got even worse for the military with the first Chechen War of 1994 to 1996. A hasty and, and botched offensive led to an intractable counterinsurgency war and a truce that felt like and was a defeat. As of 1996, the militarized giant that the USSR had always appeared to be had turned into a demoralized army and a weak polity. As uh, uh, Barani puts it, there is no similar case in world history of a dominant armed force so rapidly and so thoroughly deteriorating without being defeated in battle. Here, as elsewhere, we face a stark question. If things were so disastrous in the mid-1990s, how did Putin turn them around so quickly? And do we, in, in the early 21st century, have a throwback to the Soviet Union, or is this just a surface similarity? If we turn the clock forward just a few years from the first Chechen war, of course, we find a second Chechen campaign with much more popular backing. We find the government deploying with success a discourse of internal mobilization to meet an external threat. Patriotic education makes a comeback in the uh, 2000s, and the cult of the Great Patriotic War comes roaring back after its decline in the 1990s. The sec Second Chechen War allowed the Russian state to draw a line, more or less, under the First War and even under Afghanistan, or at least to sanitize and heroize those conflicts. Russia perhaps didn't quite find a place in the pantheon for the protagonists of its counterinsurgency operations, but it did at least manage to show these wars as cont contributing to a newly robust statehood. The soldiers' mothers, uh, so important in undermining the uh, legitimacy of the military in the uh, late 1980s, early 1990s, on closer inspection, did, did little to challenge uh, the basic militaristic v uh, values of, of Russian society. Pacifism was still, was still a dirty word. Under Putin, uh, the military achieved much greater public prominence, but to the extent it participated in politics, it did so on the president's terms. And eventually, um, uh, through Anatoly uh, Sedyukov, after many years of stalled initiatives, um, the military had to face up to painful reforms in the wake of the South Ossetian War in 2008. Undoubtedly, since then, the Russian army has become better funded, more technologically sophisticated, more mobile and responsive, uh, 
and better, uh, better run. But I'm no military analyst, uh, and I'm, I, I'm not exactly sure what this implies for the long term, and uh, for example, whether the high military budgets of recent, recent times are sustainable. What I want to do instead is end with some reflections on uh, m the main uh, subject for tonight, which is the relationship between military, the military and society. Um, uh, reflections that suggest that not quite as much has changed as we might think. It was, uh, it was said by a number of observers in the post-Soviet period that the Russian military had, had become a, quote, worker peasant army again, like in the 1920s. But the difference is that peasants are now a small proportion of the population rather than a large majority, and military service is not the same channel of upward mobility. By 2004, only about 10% of young men of recruitment age could be drafted, as, uh, as compared with about 50% of young men who were serving in the Brezhnev era. The recruitment pool, uh, uh, even after the military reforms of 2008, uh, is, is still of poor quality and it's dwindling. So where are, all these, uh, where are all these soldiers and in particular professional soldiers going to come from? If we look beyond the army itself, however, we find that ambient levels of violence, both real and symbolic, remain high in Russian society. And this is the subject of an interesting uh, research project done by Jan Behrens in Potsdam at the moment. Uh, Jan Behrens is interested in, in the long continuities stretching from Afghanistan in the 1980s to recent uh, developments in the, in the Donbass. As um, uh, Behrens argues, scholars have been inclined to remark on the surprising absence of violence in the uh, breakup of the Soviet Union in uh, uh, 1991 uh, and just after, but have been rather less attentive to the uh, many residues of violent practices in post-Soviet societies. A small clue came in the riots at the Football European Championships in France l um, last summer. Russian hooligans uh, stood out from their English counterparts, for example, for their almost paramilitary style of organization. It seemed to me, uh, l looking on, that this was a kind of hooliganism that could only arise in a society with mass conscription. There's a degree of overlap between the quasi-military Russian violence uh, and the hooligan violence that you find elsewhere in the, in the world that arises from late industrial anami. But the Russian example seemed to suggest a more intimate and sustained experience of violence uh, than, say, English thugs uh, uh, could, could, mu could muster. Uh, our, our English hooligans are already half a century on from, from conscription and colonial wars. Um, we also need to remember a domestic Russian legacy of Soviet-era violence, the 1990s. Back in the 1990s, it was uh, plausible to think of Russian society as a set of uh, nested protection rackets. Uh, people moved back, uh, free, uh, freely back and forth between uniformed positions to forms of what Vadim Volkov called violent entrepreneurship. To use a molecular image, violence was a free radical in Russian society. Okay, so it, uh, it moved out of the army proper into all kinds of, of other, other arenas. But, NB, uh, all of this does not make uh, present-day Russia militarized in the sense of the Soviet era. Don't be misled, uh, Russian society is not ready for sacrifice. There's, there's still a great unwillingness to uh, serve in the armed forces, and the cult of World War II actually keeps uh, uh, that conflict, the, the, the conflict of the 1940s, at a safe and sanitized distance. There's a lot of support for military at the symbolic level, but this does not correlate with readiness for personal sacrifice. So what I would say is that if Soviet uh, Russia under Stalin was militarized without being militaristic, in today's Russia, it's the reverse that is closer to being the case. To quote uh, David Stone in his uh, important work on industrialization and militarization, um, hammer and uh, rifle, uh, militarization is, quote, less a thing than a process involving the organization of society for violence. 
The ultimate result is a society organized for war and lacking clear boundaries between military and civil life, end of quotation. While Russian society uh, does have violence, it lacks organization. And the boundaries between military and civil life are much firmer than they were even in the 1970s, let, it, let alone in the 1920s. So what can we say about the overall trajectory since 1917? The revolution and civil war left the political system and the military completely intertwined. But this was never a relationship between equals. The leading role of the party was asserted violently under Stalin, uh, and less violent, violently, but perhaps even more effectively, under Gorbachev. At most other times, the political leadership and the military achieved a mutually beneficial working relationship under overall party hegemony. But party hegemony ended in 1990, and Putin and United Russia are not quite an adequate replacement. Military symbols and practices are much more prominent in Russian society than in Western liberal democracies. Violence, both uh, real and symbolic, is more extreme than in Western democracies as colonial and post-colonial conflicts, above all in Afghanistan and Chechnya, leave their traces. But while Russia might have the uh, form of militarization, it does not have the content. This is not a society uh, mobilized for self-defense, whether against internal or external enemies. What this implies for the future of state society relations in Russia is another matter. I think I've done enough, uh, had enough to, uh, on my plate talking about the last 100 years. But if anyone wants to. Uh, engage in speculation uh, in the questions. Uh, okay, thank you very much.